a lot of people have been involved with the CIA over the years, both directly and indirectly. Yes, a lot of people have been involved. Particularly this man, John Stockwell, who is with us tonight on Alternative Views News Magazine. with us tonight John Stockwell, the former CIA case officer who's back for an encore performance. We're going tonight to discuss the On Company Business, the documentary film that has been made recently about the CIA. Uh, John, and we'll be seeing some sections of that film uh, tonight, tonight. Right. I right. should have mentioned that uh, earlier. We have a few clippings <laughs> that we will discuss and uh, comment on. And we're also going to discuss John Stockwell's court case where the government is suing him because he allegedly broke his contract or oath with the CIA not to disclose any information about their operations. And according to a recent Supreme Court decision, former employees of the CIA no longer have the right to disclose secrets about the agency. Um, John, could you tell us a few uh, things about the government lawsuit um, against you? First of all, what uh, was the Frank Snepp case? What was the Supreme Court decision that's the basis of the government's uh, harassment of you now? Well, Frank Snepp wrote a book uh, similar to mine about the, the collapse of South Vietnam and the scandal of the U.S. evacuation of, of South Vietnam in 1975. And uh, he, like me, did not submit the book for a CIA review or censorship. Uh, for the obvious reason, they would not have let him publish the, uh, the entire story. Uh, as a result, the CIA sued him in a test case. The reason they picked him was because his book uh, came out before mine by a few months. And then when mine came out, they said that they would have preferred, they wished they'd waited and gotten me instead. Uh, for technical reasons, my case would have been more interesting to them, and actually it would have been more interesting to me. I think I could have made a better fight than Frank Snap did of it. But uh, they took it to their favorite court in Alexandria, Virginia, where the judges are <laughs> notoriously biased in favor of the agency, well, flagrantly that's, that's right next door to them. Right, right next door. <laughs> the statements the judges made during the trial, like early on, uh, that the facts of the case didn't interest him one damn bit, mispronouncing Frank Snepp's name repeatedly during the trial, interrupting on behalf of the, the, the district attorney, the prosecution, uh, to to uh, protest testimony that, that the judge didn't like was going on. He would say, objection sustained when there had been no objection, and things like this throughout the trial. And then, perhaps the most uh, incredible of all, uh, when Snap tried to get uh, some waiting to get the transcript of some of the incredible statements that were made in court through the, the, the transcript of the proceedings, found that they had been expunged. So they were not part of the court record, even though all of the attorneys and journalists present were witness that they had been said. And uh, the CIA taking snap to this court 
the judge uh, referred during the proceedings to Frank Snepp's ill-gotten gains from his book and ruled uh, in heavily in favor of the government that Snepp should have to pay the government everything he'd earned from the book. Even though Snepp never did reveal any information that was classified. They never claimed that he had, he had revealed a single secret. Their point was that he had signed a contract with the government not to attack the government without the government's permission and therefore he, his book was illegal, a breach of contract, and that he, by signing that, had waived all of his First Amendment rights. He no longer had freedom of speech. The appeals court in Richmond, Virginia, ruled in, in the CI's favor, but they ruled that, the, the, uh, that a judge, a federal judge, could not affix the damages, that a jury would have to affix the damages, that the judge could award for, uh, the government one dollar from Frank Snap. The Supreme Court, in a decision this last January, which was uh, described in the dissenting opinion as unique in the history of the Supreme Court, it refused to hear the case. It refused to hear Frank Snepp's arguments or the government's arguments, but it ruled in favor of the government. It ruled, it gave the government more power than it had asked for. Beyond that, it legislated new law. It's supposed to interpret existing law, but it ruled in its, in its written statement that its objective was to create a situation, a law that would protect the confidentiality it considered necessary to the functioning of the CIA. Now that clearly is the Congress's responsibility to legislate new law, but it did, it did rule that and we are now stuck with the, the SNEP decision. SNEP is having to pay back $120,000 from proceeds of his book. Three weeks later, the government uh, initiated its lawsuit against me to, to deprive me of my uh, ill-gotten gains. <laughs> You're going to stop having parties and uh, give away back all those Roller Royces and stuff like that <laughs> you've been going to have. Yeah. I, we, we, we laughed. Actually, uh, the government was not aware of the fact that uh, a book like that does not make that much money. And uh, three years, the money is long since spent. Three years of my travel and research costs and my taxes and the money is spent. And I lived, as you well know, quite <laughs> modestly uh, during the interim. John, what are uh, the implications of this uh, Supreme Court uh, decision? What does this mean vis-a-vis -vis First Amendment uh, rights and government secrecy and suppression of information from the public? Well, it means very simply that in that decision that the Supreme Court has upset the delicate balance of power on which our government functions. It means that people, according to, the, to their law, their ruling, people who have worked for the government, whether or not you signed an agreement, even if you did not sign an agreement, you have a fiduciary responsibility not to attack the government without its permission if you've worked for the government. If you do, they cannot, under that ruling, put you in jail, but they can sue you for whatever damages a judge without a jury decides to stick you with. Now that means, for example, that, see, the CIA is an office of the White House, and that means that the President has in his power to, to do incredible things, as the CIA has, truly incredible things, depraved things, and people who know what these secrets are are not allowed to speak out about it, much less do anything about it, is quite literally an official secrets ruling. Uh, it's not an act of Congress, but it's an act of the Supreme Court. The, under this ruling, they cannot put you in jail, but they can sue uh, any former government employee for damages if he attacks the government. Now, by attacking the government, mind you, I didn't write a book calling for a violent overthrow of the government. I wrote a book which exposed a war the CIA had done in Angola, an irresponsible war in which 10,000 people were killed needlessly, not even to protect our national security, and about Henry Kissinger and William Colby lying to the Congress to cover up that war. I felt that I was in a position where my bosses had consciously and flagrantly defied the Constitution and were functioning as a secret police separate apart and above the Constitution. And I, I struggled with my conscience at length, but I decided that if it comes down to loyalty to the CIA and loyalty to the Constitution, you must choose in favor of the, the Constitution. I was wrong, according to our Supreme Court. It is the heaviest blow to the First Amendment in the history of this country. It's also very interesting that the 
people like the uh, ACLU, Civil Liberties Union, and the press have roundly criticized the Supreme Court for this decision. What was the vote, by the way, in the court? Do you remember uh, one of us? Three dissenting opinions. Three so this is uh, sort of Nixon's revenge, uh, the Supreme Court on the American people. Well, I must say, though, that this is really not an unusual attack. We've seen from the Trilateral Commission <coughs> the book uh, Crisis of Democracy, indicating that they want legislation to do just what the Supreme Court has done. Mm -hmm. And the Senate Bill 1 and the son of Senate Bill 1, which has been pushed so hard by uh, Senator Kennedy, mm -hmm. and which has been fought so much by, and successfully so far, by the ACLU, also would legalize exactly mm -hmm. what the Supreme Court has already done. So it isn't that the Supreme Court is such a maverick in this sense. Wasn't there another uh, bizarre decision that came a week or two or shortly after uh, the SNAP uh, decision? And that is, didn't the uh, Supreme Court give Henry Kissinger um, the right to use secret government documents when he was Secretary of State to write um, a book that he was writing, and moreover, not to let any other scholars even look at them to uh, sort of withhold them from the Freedom of Information Act? Could you uh, comment on this and some of the implications yeah, of this, this was Kissinger also, decision? This was also uh, uh, verbalized by the judge in the Frank Snepp case who ruled, who stated that, uh, that it was his opinion that high-level government employees should be free to, to write books and, and whatnot, but middle and lower-level employees should not. And uh, read that that if you, you are a high-level employee and you write something that is patently false and full of lies, it's okay. If it's an apology for the crimes you've committed or those around you have committed, it's okay. But if you're someone who is in the middle levels, deeply involved in what really happened and want to tell the American public about what was done with our tax dollars, often to the American public, that is not permissible. Well, speaking of telling about the CIA and what is happening in it, this movie, which of which we'll see parts this evening, is really one of the most effective pieces of filmmaking I've ever seen. It just hits you emotionally, time and time again. Um, how did it? Uh, how did it happen? How did it all start? Well, you know, I wasn't. Uh, involved in it in, in any way in its production. I was just interviewed on it for uh, an hour or two, but we do have someone with us here by extraordinary good luck and good fortune who was uh, very much involved. Molly Doherty of, is from Austin and happens to be visiting in town, and she helped Alan Frankovich get this film moving. How long did it uh, take Alan to make this uh, movie, or the whole film crew, um, Molly? It's an extraordinary uh, collection of uh, newsreels, of interviews. It must have taken a long time to make. How long was he working on this? Well, I think he was working on it close to seven years. And a lot of the problem was it's not just an extraordinary amount of research involved in such a film in order that every detail be totally accurate and corroborated by several sources, but also that he had to spend a lot of time uh, fundraising because there, he couldn't find anybody to financially back up the movie. Nobody put up a million dollars to do it? Is that Rolf and Exxon weren't interested <laughs> no, in no, people he, learning about the CIA? <laughs> no, they weren't very supportive. And uh, the movie cost altogether around $350,000, and that was mostly raised in $50, $100, and a few thousand dollar increments. So that's one reason the film took so long to make. Where has it been shown? I know it's been here on PBS. And it's been around the country on PBS. And, um, uh, what about outside the country? Uh, well, it's shown at uh, Cannes Film Festival mm -hmm. uh, last week, I believe. What was the reaction there? I haven't heard yet. Haven't heard. At the yeah, Berlin I, Festival, it won the, the it Critics won. Award. Yeah, it won the Critics Award for the for the best uh, movie. It's 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 unbelievable some of the material they have. Even the tape recording of the Tupamaro uh, guerrillas holding the CIA butcher and talking to him. And you can see him denying that he's, and you hear him denying that he's a member of the CIA, and talking about oh how, uh, how sorry he is that people are going to be hurt, and here he was involved in torturing and training other people to torture. Incredible. All over. You know, it's uh, been it's been said in the reviews right. of this movie that trying to document for for a film, uh, CIA past secret operations is like trying to catch a vampire's image in the mirror. You know, it's it's it seems to be impossible. 
but these filmmakers, by interviewing people and taking film clips of situations, what really happened, and working very, very hard for a long period of time, have come up with incredible documentation. Not one reviewer that I've read has challenged the accuracy or authenticity of any point they make in this film. There are some people who, who've said that the film was biased against the CIA because Colby and Helms looked like such hard people, <laughs> and that it was therefore the filmmaker was trying to catch the pro-CIA people in order to make them look harsh and hard. And of course, that's, that's nonsense. These gentlemen were, in fact, are, in fact, very hard individuals who were running an organization that was into some very heavy stuff. It yeah, also he lets them, go ahead. Yeah, he basically lets those people damn themselves with their own words. Exactly. I mean, he has uh, films, um, or has a film clip of George Meany denying that um, they got any money from the CIA, mm -hmm. and then the, in the next segment he documents how they did get money from the CIA. I say to you categorically now that it is not true. Well, under no circumstances have, uh, have we ever received or solicited any money from the CIA. It doesn't say that the AFL-CIO received it. Well, 33 million doesn't go to the AFL-CIO. It goes to the AIFLD. Well, that means that these unions you mentioned have, have stated just as categorical as I have that they do not receive and have not received CIA money. The CIA's trade union operations are affected through a vast bureaucracy of people. These are the officers of the international trade unions and of the national unions, especially in the United States, through which the CIA is able to infiltrate and um, manipulate the international unions. Um, of course, Mr. Meany is, uh, has been in the past uh, one of the principal, if not the principal, uh, U.S. trade unionist through which these operations are affected. I am a Andy McClellan. I'm the inter-American representative of the AFL-CIO and have been since 1964. Prior to that time, I was the associate inter-American representative. And prior to that time, I was inter-American representative of the International Union of Food and Allied Workers based in Geneva, but working in Latin America. I'm the executive director of the American Institute for Free Labor Development. Uh, prior to that time, as a matter of fact, I've been the executive director now for some 10 years, and I've been with the American Institute for Free Labor Development since its founding in 1962. Uh, for the uh, period immediately prior to 1962, I was the Inter-American Representative of the Postal Telegraph and Telephone International, uh, which has headquarters in Switzerland, but I was their, uh, their representative in the Western Hemisphere. There have been some people who have accused uh, the AFL-CIO of collaborating with the CIA, and what would be your uh, response to that accusation? I think that is so ridiculous and so infantile, so juvenile, to make such an accusation. And you, Mr. Doherty? Oh, I agree. I, I don't know of any labor leader that wouldn't uh, out and out deny such an accusation. It's just not true. In Latin America, one of the principal and most effective of the trade unionists, of the American trade unionists who worked with us, was Bill Doherty. Uh, he had originally started in the uh, Post Telegraph and Telephone Workers International, uh, coming up through the Communications Workers of America. Uh, later on, he was transferred into the American Institute for Free Labor Development. This was set up during the Kennedy period and uh, is a joint effort by American trade unionists like George Meany and the heads of American-based multinational corporations which operate in Latin America. Order is restored, but not before 11 persons are killed and a crippling general strike is called over the power struggle between the president and the parliament of Brazil. Says Mr. Doherty, quote, what happened in Brazil on April 1st did not just happen, it was planned, and planned months in advance. Many of the trade union leaders, some of whom were actually trained in our institute, were involved in the revolution and in the overthrow of the Goulart regime. Immediately prior to the, the, uh, the military takeover in Brazil, uh, there was a group of students from Brazilian unions in training uh, in Front Royal. Uh, this wasn't the first of the Brazilian groups that have been here, nor has it been the last. We've, we've had them continuously. They weren't uh, in any kind of a course training for revolutionary activities or clandestine activities. They were in a regular collective bargaining course. It so happens that when many of those students went back home from that course, their unions were involved in this struggle uh, against the attempt of the communists to take over some of the unions, and that's 
precisely what I meant by the statement. One aspect of the film is that, that's I think very important, is that it has no narration. That it doesn't tell you what to think about what you're seeing. Uh, what it does is it was an incredible research job and all these interviews with people from various points of view. It lets those people tell the story and get, exposes what the public record is and then lets you draw your own conclusions. And it shows the cause and effect. For instance, it will take a look at CIA torture schools held in the United States. The police program began uh, on a large scale under Dwight Eisenhower. He felt there was a need to train the police to help with the uh, fighting of communism after the Second World War. He recruited for the purpose a man named Byron Engel. Byron Engel was, uh, by the time he came into this program, a member of the CIA. So um, the only way they get their information is through torture? Whenever one could get the information about a specific high-ranking official in, in torture, not one of these men off the street, but a man who had based his career on his ability to extract information from political prisoners, in the cases that I investigated, I found that they had been trained at a United States base. Like torture, electric shocks, and uh, beatings, and telephones, and finally, it's a few hours like that. Many of the people I spoke with, exiles, political exiles in Europe, had been tortured with U.S. Army field telephones. They were simple, they were easy to operate, and we had sent them in large numbers as part of our military assistance plan. You hook up wires to the telephone, and you put one wire perhaps um, on a man's penis. When women are tortured, oftentimes the higher ranking officials will find an excuse to come by and watch the torture. I decided that I would confirm everything they wanted. It was in such a condition. Um, they certainly wouldn't uh, settle for less. And uh, I didn't want to go through any more torture. I was, um, ideologically, I was weak enough to, to say, well, if they know, why not? What we brought to it, what we as, as the United States, through our efficient system, brought, was the sense that you used only the amount of torture appropriate to get information. And the reason torture persists is that although the can't among the police officers is that torture is not an effective way to get information, it, of course, is. And torture is a necessity of the system, not, uh, not because some minds, um, sick minds think of it. And then they would show, uh, they had, for instance, A.G. talking about how they would uh, attempt to subvert the democratic process of a particular country. At any one time, uh, down in, Latin, in Ecuador, we had on our payroll, or in an intimate working relationship with our station, um, one vice president, a president of the Chamber of Deputies, a president of the Senate, a vice president of the Senate, a number of senators, a number of deputies, uh, the secretary general of the Democratic so Socialist Party. Uh, we even created a party down there, which we called the Popular Revolutionary Liberal Party, which would appeal to a lot of different people. We had extensive propaganda operations during this period also. They love to brag about inside the agency, about uh, the situations the CIA helped create that were so favorable to the United States. Now, what they talk about, the common denominator, is strong men they were able to put in power in key situations and governments they were able to, to reverse. Uh, one of these was the Shah, who was ousted in a coup, and the CIA uh, had a counter coup and brought him back. And the CIA used to love to brag about this and uh, what a great man the Shah was as they proceeded to train Savak and, uh, and its forces. They were, of course, very close to Batista. They were very close to just about Magsaysay the, the, and the current president of the Philippines, uh, Pak in South Korea, in country after country after country of our uh, allies or our client states in the third world, this, you, you, you find that the CIA helped put in power the dictator 
or reinforced someone who had just gotten into power, train their police, train them in oppression of, uh, suppression of the people, and it worked for a decade, a decade and a half, sometimes for 20 years. But unfortunately, the people of the world, uh, uh, I say unfortunately from the CIA point of view, the people of the world uh, have become too restless and they're kicking out the dictators one after the other and turning on the United States in the process. It was a short-sighted policy and a policy that's now, I believe, it's thoroughly bankrupt. Um, John, something that struck me about uh, the movie um, on company business, the documentary, was how it revealed the uh, relationship between the CIA and other parts of what might be called the American power structure. In other words, the unions were very active in CIA operations. Business, the multinationals were, the media were on CIA uh, payrolls or were used as CIA mouthpieces. Federal government agencies were working in uh, cooperation um, with the uh, CIA. I think that there, it proves that there has been a, a desire, a compulsion, by the leaders of this country and the leaders of industry uh, to, to function with and through a secret police organization, i.e. to bypass and subvert the, 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 the way the Constitution maps out the way our government should run. For example, in Angola, the, wa the war that I wrote about, that I was so deeply involved in, uh, the, the, there were various elements in the society, the American community, that, that had no interest whatsoever in having a war happen there. It was not in our national security interests in any sense of the word. But by having the CIA do it, uh, you did not have to have public debate. Uh, the multinationals that actually were, were opposed to the war couldn't debate in Congress, nor could the missionaries, nor could the academics. Uh, nor could the smaller business people with interest in Angola. You can do it secretly mm -hmm. and you don't have government by the people. And it's very curious. This is a, a turning upside down of what one of the men in the uh, documentary said. He was one of the ex-CIA people who did a lot of talking, but he said, I'm not one of those kiss and tell people like Stockwell. Mm. And he said, I think that somewhere... That Phillips, I believe. Yeah, Phillips. Yeah. He said somewhere in that what well, problem is the CIA that we were sending in the CIA to do things that we should have sent our army in to do? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and the, uh, back to the subject of the objectivity of this film, I, mm -hmm. I would like to point out that, uh, that uh, Alan Frankovich and Howard Dretch went so far in a couple of points that, that I, they gave the establishment figures, the CIA figures, such an opportunity to speak that uh, I, I think that they went beyond fairness. For example, one element uh, in the film, one point in the film that simply makes my blood boil is where they let this Atlee Phillips, who, is, who, who resigned from the CIA to create the CIX's organization to go about propagandizing and, and lobbying on behalf of the CIA. Uh, they, they allow him to say in the film that he is convinced that Phil Agee is the agent of some foreign government. Oh. And that, to me, is outrageous that, one, that he would say it, but that doesn't surprise me, but it should not be included in an objective film because, of course, that is the cheapest kind of a shot, just about on a par of the level of, of dignity or non-dignity of the CIA to say that, well, he attacked us, so he must be an agent of a foreign government. There was something interesting, though, about uh, AG in the second part um, of that film. It was widely reported in the uh, media in America, and I believe this myself, yeah, that uh, a CIA case officer in Greece was killed because uh, Phil Agee had revealed his address, his name, his uh, location, and that he was therefore responsible for this uh, CIA agent's um, mm -hmm. death. Well, Agee uh, denied that and pointed out that um, it was well known in Athens that for the last 20 years, a CIA case officer had lived in a certain house in a certain... Yeah, the station uh, chief had lived in the same house. Four successions of station chiefs had lived in the same house, and they were public figures. And I mean, they had cocktail parties that the, the, the diplomatic and police community went to that, you know, they were all going to the CIA station chief's house. Everyone in town knew that was the CIA's house. Meanwhile, the station in Athens had supported, engineered, if you will, more than one coup of the, the government of, of Greece and also had dabbled in every situation in the Middle East. So they had a lot of bitter enemies with the station chief 
living in the same house. And as as the, they point out in this, A.G. points out in this film, the station chief had been ordered by headquarters to get a, a new house, a clean house, and he'd refused because he didn't want to drive the extra 20 minutes. A.G. had not known this man while he was in the CIA and had not revealed his name. And yet, uh, very conveniently, the CIA has used that man's death as the, their, their cudgel to go after A.G. and try to make him out as to a, a traitor and a killer of American agents. Well, they've hounded him all over the, all over the Western Hemisphere and they also certainly in have. Europe. They, they've gotten him run out of four countries in Europe he was trying to live. I think one of the most interesting things about the film, A.G. is such a controversial character made so by our media and by our government, and yet I've met him. I had the pleasure in, uh, in January when I was traveling through Europe. He is an individual who comes across as very calm, extraordinarily warm in human vibrations, very intellectual. He was deeply troubled by what he saw the CIA doing in Latin America and concluded the only way to fight it was to, to get out and write about it and expose its operations. He had a fascinating exchange with the New York Times recently where someone wrote an article saying that uh, A.G. had his right, I believe it was to his passport, but that uh, they, they disagreed with him otherwise because of his exposing names. So Phil wrote a rebuttal, which they did publish, in which he pointed out that he had not revealed a CIA officer's name in well over three years, whereas, and he listed all of the cases, and there must have been a dozen, where the New York Times had revealed CI officers' <laughs> names and well, just nailed them to the wall with their hypocrisy. Well, as you've said on previous programs that we've had with you, that overseas it's common knowledge as who is a CIA agent. Absolutely. Or at least the American, maybe not the contract agent, but at least the case officer 80, and where he lives and all. Eighty-five percent of the CIA case officers not only are well known, but they play to that because it's glamorous to be the CIA guy, the spook. Plus, plus the fact that the uh, KGB, the Russian KGB officials, have social relationships with oh, the CIA. <laughs> endlessly. <laughs> drinking vodka together. Endlessly. So and I, I, I was in uh, Germany once and I picked up this book, uh, Who's Who in the CIA, and they had literally thousands of people uh, listed, <laughs> including three of the neighbors that I grew up with in Falls Church, Virginia. That uh, So uh, in certain uh, areas of the world, it's no secret who well, the CIA uh, officers are. This gets back to the crux of the whole matter of government secrecy in that it is the, the purpose of government secrecy in terms of the CIA is to keep the American public from knowing what the government is doing. The victims, the people in the countries overseas, almost always know the full truth about the bloody operations that, that are killing them and messing up their lives. Secrecy is designed to keep the American people from knowing about it. The point of that is the CIA's big push for greater secrecy and protection of its secrets is not to keep enemy agents from knowing what it's doing. They know. It's to keep, a, it's political. It's to keep the American public, the electorate, from knowing what it's doing because the American public could rise up and vote the CIA out of existence. Therefore, it's hammering away to muzzle me and SNAP and AG. It cannot exist with an educated public. If it continued its operations of killing people overseas, of experimenting on American citizens with drugs and drug sex mind control experiments, the American people would rise up and put it out of business. The only way it can continue its operations is to have secrecy to keep the American public from knowing what it's doing with this particular $13 billion a year that it spends. I think uh, one of the distressing issues of this whole uh, complex of things that you just uh, raised is how the media has been, up until this movie, On Company Business, and a couple other uh, PBS uh, discussions or documentary, the media has been glorifying the CIA. The most striking example, and I think the On Company Business really reveals this, is the story of Dan uh, Matroni, mm -hmm. a CIA agent in uh, Uruguay. We were unsuccessful in our efforts to weaken the left in Uruguay during the period when I was in Uruguay, 1964 to 1966. Our job in the face of the growth of the strength of the left during that period was to promote repression. It was the only alternative we had. In 1966, we brought in a, a CIA officer 
who set up his office in the police department under the cover of the public safety mission of AID. This officer was to work exclusively with the police intelligence, trying to improve its capabilities. This officer was still there in 1970 at the time that the American public safety mission chief, uh, Dan Mitrioni, was kidnapped and executed by the Tupamaros. Mitrione was the small city cop in Richmond, Indiana. He had advanced to the position of chief of police and had heard about Byron Engel's program in Washington, applied, and of course he was exactly the sort of person they were looking for to send abroad. Diligent, hardworking. Dan exemplified the highest principles of the police profession, that of social service. He served in Brazil for seven years, at the International Police Academy in Washington for two, and in Montevideo for one. There are a quarter of a billion people in Latin America. In many of these countries, the communist terrorists are trying to tear the fabric of democracy apart. Some of these countries, Uruguay among them, realize that the best protection against this is the development of a democratic police and have asked the United States to help. And this is what Dan was doing in Uruguay. He went to Uruguay to get information. This is part of the testimony of Manuel Oevia of Uruguay. He said regarding Mitrioni, this question of perfectionism, he insisted on an economy of effort. He used to say precise pain in the precise place at the precise time. One of the um, pieces of equipment that had been found useful were, was a wire so very thin that it could be fitted um, into the mouth between the teeth and by pressing against the gums um, increase the electrical charge and it was through the diplomatic pouches that Mitrione got some of the equipment he needed for the interrogations, including these fine wires. Several street beggars were picked up whose disappearance would attract no attention. This was a technique that Mitrione had developed, or rather perfected, in Brazil. Using these beggars, experiments were conducted with different forms of interrogation, letting the students see the effects of different voltages on different parts of the human body, male and female. All those unhappy people died without really knowing why they were undergoing this pain without even having the cowardly solution of answering any questions because they were not asked questions. They were simply guinea pigs. Dan exemplified the highest principles of the police profession. This callous murder emphasizes the essential inhumanity of the terrorist. The American people joined the president in condemning this cold-blooded crime against a defenseless human being. Mr. Mitrioni's devoted service to the cause of peaceful progress in an orderly world will remain as an example for free men everywhere. You've seen this uh, movie State of Siege that Costas uh, Garvis made. Uh, Yves Montan plays um, Dan Mitroni and shows the story of the Tuperero guerrillas and the CIA operations in Uruguay and why they kidnapped him. Well, <coughs> the U.S. media made Mitroni out a hero. Mm -hmm. They made him out a victim of uh, irrational mm -hmm. and despicable uh, violence, whereas it appears from this documentary that Matroni had his hands in some of the most savage butchery imaginable. Of and the, the point is that we're not talking about a Gestapo officer in, in Auschwitz or somewhere experimenting on people or torturing people. We're talking about... Uh, a, a fine, upstanding CIA officer doing his commission thing by the CIA. A lot of these apparatuses of torture paid for by the American government and given to these people, produced in America, and they're even trained here how to use them. What's the CIA role in that school? Yeah, the CIA uh, uh, set up several in the, in the 50s and throughout the 60s, several what they call police training schools, and uh, which included all of these techniques. Uh, they also had uh, a school or two in uh, a lo the location. I never, I never was in them, 
um, teaching people how to make plastic bombs, how to blow up things, how to throw uh, uh, Molotov cocktails into crowds and, and whatnot, how to destabilize a country. I don't know, I cannot testify that the CIA is still doing that now. The film on company business brings this out very well. I presume they are, but I don't, I don't know that. John, this raises the question of sort of the balance sheet on the uh, CIA. What is it um, accomplished? Uh, has it produced uh, useful intelligence? I mean, this is what the CIA is supposed to do in its uh, charter. It's supposed to be a central intelligence agency. What sort of intelligence, political, military, and otherwise, has it produced? What's its record in terms of producing information for the American government to make uh, intelligent political decisions? Well, the Congressman Pike put together a committee and investigated the CIA's intelligence gathering capability, and he concluded in his own words that it was lousy. The list of CIA failures to gather, in, to gather accurate intelligence, to analyze it, digest it, and disseminate it to the leaders of the country accurately, what's going to happen is a long list of incredible bungled failures numerous ones of which have led this country to the brink of World War III. Time after time after time. Take a situation, look at what the CIA did during it, and you'll find, if not the entire situation, at least major elements of it, were inaccurately reported by the CIA in a way which screwed up our government, uh, uh, government's ability to react to the situation. Well, John, what about just the gathering of information, of intelligence? as distinguished from the dirty tricks business, the going out, the overt, uh, aggressive type well, of, of behavior. Uh, the, the point is that secrecy doesn't work very well. Spies are the poorest source of intelligence that you can get anywhere. You're talking about mm -hmm. it. Play gossip at, at the next time you have a party over with intelligent friends and just start something verbally and let it come back around the room and see how it resembles what happened, what was said originally. Uh, the point is it rarely does. When you get an agent who is reporting to you in secret, he, he is, he is you, you can't go with him to his office to see what was really said. He may be working for you, he may be working for you and his government to give you false information. He may be working for the Soviets to give you false information about his government. He may be a nut, he may be exaggerating, stay on your payroll. And if you take ten agents, eight of them or nine of them are going to be all of these things, and you'll be lucky to come up with one agent who is, who is sort of true and honest and conscientious. And this is not Stockwell's lone criticism or sour grapes. Every case officer in the CIA, if they're speaking candidly, will tell you this. The first thing you do if you're a case officer and you get your notes from a good agent is you take out your blue pencil and you X out all of the things that you know to be false. And if you find some paragraph or thread in there that looks interesting, you put a big circle around it, and then you use that to type up an intelligence report. So you will screen out from your best agents reporting 80% of the stuff that he reports because you think it's false. Now, of course, if your basis of information is false, then you're, you're, com you're feeding the government what it wants to know or what you think will sell or what you think your bosses will publish. Secrecy makes for lousy intelligence. So the good intelligence agency that would provide political intelligence on the Soviet Union, on different European or third world countries, what would it do as opposed to what the CIA does? In other words, how would you reform the intelligent agency? Well, uh, first, let's say categorically and emphatically, in our national security interests, we close down the CIA's dirty tricks office completely. And, uh, and I mean that in the, in the coldest, most amoral terms of evaluation. If you don't care about the 300,000 people the CIA killed in the third world, just in terms of U.S. national security, the CIA has gotten us into far, far more trouble than it's gotten us out of. By that I mean Vietnam was a CIA operations for seven years before it managed to get the, the presidency and the army involved and the Bay of Pigs, and Angola, and Iran, and Nicaragua, <coughs> and Cuba, uh, and Indonesia. Chile, and Indonesia. The list is endless of situations where the CIA has gotten us in, and not the KGB, not our enemies, but the CIA has led us into these the 18-year war against China, which made it almost impossible for well over 20 years for the United States to do business with this huge country. And we almost got the decision made to drop uh, 
atomic bombs in, all, this, in almost all these cases. In almost all these cases, we were on the brink of World War III, of the Holocaust, because of CIA activities, not because of the KGB. Of these 300,000 victims of CIA operations, not any of them, of those countries, were actively involved in terrorism or war against the United States. China wasn't dropping parach parachutists into the United States to blow up our, our installations and kill people, nor was Cuba, nor was Angola, or any of these places. It was one-sided wars killing people. But in addition to that, only uh, perhaps six, maybe ten people out of those 300,000 actually worked for the KGB. They, the CIA was not fighting the KGB. It was killing people in the third world. And perhaps 5% of them at the most, and I doubt that seriously, were Communist Party members or communists. We were talking about 300,000 just, just dead people caught on the battlefield. Now, aside from all that, uh, w which is to say, close the, the Dirty Tricks division down, play to our strength, be public, tell the world what we believe in, and deal with them openly, and we would be far further ahead in our international affairs now than, than we are. But aside from that, what do you do about gathering intelligence? So you close the operations division down, and, but you, you argue that the nation does need good intelligence in order to function. I fully agree. But intelligence gathered through covert sources, it produces a long history of failures, of corruption. You're in the chain of command from the president right down to you, and you're working for these people, and you're reporting on a situation of about which they have an important policy. Like it, during the collapse of Vietnam, the, the Kissinger's policy was Vietnamization. It would succeed. We would give them arms and they would defend themselves. That was his policy. We were ordered not to report that Vietnamization was not working until one day suddenly the South collapsed, to everybody's surprise, except for the case officers that were there looking around at things to the right and the left. And you were there at that time. You were a case I officer was there. Over there. Oh yes, I was there up country in Vietnam. Uh, if we had had public debate, the intelligence gathered in a more open way and shared with the academic community and the world, uh, it, we, we would have had the failure, the collapse of Iran, for example, the famous case where they, the CIA had in its typewriters the reports that concluded that there was no serious opposition to the Shah in Iran. It was in the typewriters the same weekend that Tehran first fell apart in the country, and that was for the same reason. You were not permitted to report that the Shah was a monster and that our policy and our relationship with, with Iran was fallacious and that, uh, that the Shah was bankrupt in his own country. John, do you think that the CIA is even capable in its present organization and with its present um, members, do you think it's even capable of providing intelligence if they have this sort of James Bond mentality or the covert operations uh, mentality, are these types of people even capable of getting intelligence that's not uh, bungled up? In other words, if, if you're into playing spy, um, chances are you're going to have a bizarre view of the world and you're going to be incapable of getting rational, objective intelligence. And secondly, you're going to have difficulty cultivating sources who are going to be uh, reliable. I fully agree, and that's, that gets down to the, the very core of my point, my argument, uh, that the CIA should be closed down in our national security interests. The, the, the managers of the CIA are activists. They're trained to do things, to take action. They enjoy it. It's exciting to mount a war and to sit in Washington and send people over to fight. It excites a certain kind of person. And that kind of person is the one that gravitates to the top of organizations like that. And those individuals are going to seek information and favor people who report information that creates a hostile, adversary situation in the world so they will have excuses to continue doing their thing. John, let me ask you this. It ties in a lot of the things which we are talking about. It seems that the Rockefellers, David Rockefeller and the Chase Manhattan Bank, the Rothschilds, who are the Rockefeller counterparts in France, and the crime syndicate, as represented by um, Resorts International, and the, let's see, who's the big man, of, uh, head of the uh, mafia? 
Oh, his name escapes Meyer me right Lansky? now. Meyer Lansky? Yeah, right, Meyer Lansky. They invested in an organization, all three of them, the underworld and the overworld, right? They invested in an organization which provides security service and intelligence service for anybody who will hire it. They hired ex-CIA people. They hired people from Interpol, National Security Agency, from the FBI. They hired an ex-Air Force uh, general whose main job was security. They hired an ex-district attorney whose main job it was to investigate and ferret out and to uh, prosecute the crime syndicate. And they also have ties through the Rothschilds with Mossad. Now, to me, this is the outline. I don't know, haven't heard anything about it since then, but this seems to me the outlines of a, of a really monster. a monstrous organization where of you tie monster. all of these together. Isn't this one of the things wrong with secret intelligence agencies is that it feeds right-wing paramilitary groups. Um, there's a lot of uh, private intelligence uh, operating uh, companies that do sort of dirty work for corporations, industrial spying and probably worse, um, who are often former CIA or FBI agencies. So it just creates a climate um, and operations and practices in society that are anti-democratic and are dangerous. There's an art, another article in Penthouse talking about the EPIC, which is uh, El Paso Information Center. By the, it's uh, run by the Drug Enforcement Agency, and it has inputs from all of the police and intelligence organizations from all over the country, including an inter interface into Interpol. This is a result of Nixon's decision uh, several years ago that all the intelligence agencies should funnel, provide information to the Drug Enforcement Agency. So they have computers now that bring in all this information from their information banks into this area. So raw data, unsubstantiated, unevaluated, it goes into the computer. So anybody can be tabbed by them, and uh, this is another area where the intelligence for the CIA is creeping into, out of the CIA and into the rest of our lives. Uh, a, a small thing perhaps, but uh, an ex-CIA um, ex agent who was involved in these cop training programs, torture places, has just been made head of the New Mexico prison, where they had the uprising a while back. But you see it more and more. Well, John, thanks a lot for uh, coming on our program again. Let's move now from 1980 to 1987 and check out some news stories about the subject we've been talking about. Every month or so, I get a publication from Amnesty uh, International since I'm a, a member. It's called, uh, appropriately enough, Amnesty Action. I guess it's just a newsletter of some sort. And they give a rundown on who's being tortured in the world. They have one particular section I always look at gives a rundown on Central America and what's going on down there. And I'd like to read you a little bit of it. I think it's interesting. For instance, in Brazil, their new civilian government is introducing measures to protect human rights, although Amnesty continues to receive reports of torture and killings in that country. And Argentine government is proceeding uh, with trials against nine military commanders for the disappearances that occurred between 76 and 82. And efforts there are continuing to find uh, 100 children that are still missing that uh, disappeared during this reign. They say also arbitrary arrest, torture, and killings by Guatemalan and Salvadoran military and paramilitary forces appear to be more selectively directed against suspected government opponents last year. This is more so than in previous years. And both governments are also targeting trade unionists and human rights workers for oppression. In Honduras, opposition forces reportedly uh, torture and assassinate uh, their citizens there. Amnesty cites uh, indications that the United States' assistance to these forces encourages or condones these abuses. In Colombia, there's increased disappearances and political killings by government agencies. And there's a steep rise in abductions and killings in Chile. And they go on to say that in Mexico, there's also a, a number of documented cases the thing that's interesting about this is that they also m mention Nicaragua. This is the Amnesty International, remember. And the only thing they say about Nicaragua is, quote, Amnesty's concerns in Nicaragua focused on short-term detention of prisoners of conscience. 
So no matter what the Reagan administration tells you, the people who are really in the business of documenting torture tell it completely different. On September 8 of 1985, the White House asked Congress for $54 million to counter the terrorist threats to start this business all over again of training and supervising the Central American police and army forces, same thing that they were stopped from doing a few years ago. But the administration says that likes this program so much, they plan to make it a global one, so it will serve as a model in the worldwide fight against terrorism. Speaking of state-sponsored terrorism and torture, there was a report just released today by the America's Watch Group, which is a New York-based civil rights organization that indicated that the Contras have one of the worst records in the world for civil liberties violations. According to this 170-page report that was just released, the, con uh, the conduct of the military conflict, particularly by the insurgent forces, which are the Contras, continued to have a severe impact on the rural, rural civilians in Nicaragua. Violations of the law of armed conflicts by the Contras caused great suffering to the Nicaraguan people. At a news conference releasing the report, their chairman, Ira Nair, said that the Contras still engage in selective but systematic killing of persons they perceive as representing the government in indiscriminate attacks against civilians or in disregard for their safety and in outrages against the personal dignity of prisoners. One of the worst things that the countries have been doing is setting lion mines. And I just saw on C-SPAN an interview with Elliot Abrams, who's the Assistant Secretary of State in charge of Central America. And he was claiming that the Contra landmines are only set off by remote control and only are targeted against military targets, <laughs> but that they've made a few mistakes. Whereas <laughs> I've read report after report that was confirmed in this America Watch report that indiscriminately they put landmines all over different rural areas of Nicaragua that whoever goes over them, civilian, military, innocent tourist, is going to get blown up and that that's part of a policy of systematic terrorism by the Contras that have been denounced in this America Watch. And Craig, just like Amnesty International, they said that the Nicaraguan government had not engaged in any systematic uh, violation of civil liberties, that they'd been somewhat rough in their interrogation activities of people suspected of aiding the Contras, but that there was no evidence of torture or murder of any uh, political prisoners. And they say that the Nicaraguans in this report, the Nicaraguan Sandinista government, has improved in recent years in their civil rights Liberty, uh, civil rights record, particularly as they've treated the Mosquito Indians, who at one time were subject to government repression, but now have been treated better in recent years by the Sandinista government. Whereas the America's Watch report concluded that the Contras were becoming worse in their violation of civil liberties. And that was Alternative Views for this evening. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas 78713.